Hello and welcome to Hard Money. I'm Natalie Brunel. The latest GDP numbers were released today and the U.S. economy contracted for a second straight quarter. So recession or no recession, that is the big economic question and the White House has been struggling to answer it. Now, historically, a recession has been defined as two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth, but the White House believes that definition is no longer correct. Watch this exchange between White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre and a reporter. If things are going so great, though, then why is it the White House officials are trying to redefine recession? No, we're not redefining recession. If we all understand a recession to be two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth in a row, and then you have White House officials come up here to say, no, 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 that's not what a recession is. It's something else. How is that not redefining recession? Because that's not the definition. In an official White House blog post, the government appears to be changing the longstanding definition of a recession. But check out this montage of how Washington economic and political insiders used to define recession, compiled by media outlet Newsbusters. Two negative quarters of GDP growth is not uh, the technical definition of recession. It's not the definition that economists have traditionally uh, relied on. The definition of a recession is a decline in output for two consecutive quarters or about six months. A recession is just two consecutive quarters of economic decline. When we talk about the possibility of a recession, what is a recession? A recession is two consecutive quarters. Two consecutive quarters. Two consecutive quarters. Two consecutive quarters, two consecutive quarters, quarters, quarters of declining GDP. Because as you know, it's two consecutive quarters of down GDP. That signals it is actually a definition of a recession. And I mean, the co most common definition of a recession, two consecutive quarters of negative growth. Even if we don't have two consecutive quarters of negative growth, we might have one quarter of growth so deep that it's classified as a recession. The White House now wants to use the definition supplied by the National Bureau of Economic Research. The NBER defines recession as a significant decline in economic activity that is spread across the economy and lasts more than a few months. The White House believes the strong labor market and low unemployment are signs that we are not in a recession. And that's a statement echoed by Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. She said earlier this week that the economy is slowing, but consumer spending is high. Caveat, much of that is via credit. She said household finances are solid. Caveat, nothing indicates that to be true. And she said we have record low unemployment. Caveat, unemployment claims are spiking. Yellen went on to say that she sees no evidence of a recession. Keep in mind that Yellen also said that inflation was only transitory. As you can probably guess, many economists and business operators would say we are most definitely in recession territory. We did just have two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth, and according to former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers, we are in a recession due to record trade deficits, record inflation, wages not keeping up with inflation, and record prices on housing, food, and gas. Also, the International Monetary Fund released its July World Economic Outlook and officials there forecast a significant slowdown in global growth. The IMF predicts the risk of recession will be particularly prominent in 2023. One unofficial indicator that we are in a recession is by taking a look at Walmart. Walmart is the world's largest retailer and often considered a bellwether for the overall economy. Earlier this week, it reduced its profit outlook for the rest of 2022. The company's CEO says people are forced to spend more money on food and gas, and that leaves less discretionary money for clothing and electronics. While economists debate the official meaning of the word recession, we are seeing more and more signs of a housing cooldown. During the pandemic, home prices jumped by about 42%. However, home sales over the past few months are plummeting and inventory levels are spiking. New data released this week shows existing home sales were down for a fifth consecutive month. Sales on new construction homes dropped by 8% in June and are down 17% compared to this time last year. Inventory almost doubled in June and homes are staying on the market much longer. Once again, in an effort to combat the record high inflation of 9.1%, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates by 75 basis points this week. After the rate hike, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell had this to say about the economy and consumer sentiment. Recent indicators of spending and production have softened. Growth in consumer spending has slowed significantly, in part reflecting lower real disposable income and tighter financial conditions. Activity in the housing sector has weakened in part reflecting higher mortgage rates. And after a strong increase in the first quarter, business fixed investment also looks to have declined in the second quarter. Despite these developments, the labor market has remained extremely tight with the unemployment rate near a 50 year low, 
job vacancies near historical highs, and wage growth elevated. But Powell also had this to say when asked if the economy is in a recession. I do not think the U.S. is currently in a recession. Um, and the reason is there are just too many areas of the economy that are, that are performing, uh, you know, too well. And, and, of course, I would point to the labor market in, in particular. You know, 2.7 million people hired in the first half of the year. Uh, it doesn't make sense that the economy would be in recession with, with this kind of thing happening. Now, the Fed is also said to accelerate its quantitative tightening plan to reduce its $9 trillion balance sheet. But the higher the base rate hike by the Fed, the more problematic it is for investors. Historically, more tightening will mean more conservative conditions prevailing across the economy. As the global macroeconomic picture continues to decelerate, let's take a look at what's happening in and around Bitcoin, which remains choppy in the low $20,000 range. A former Coinbase employee, Ishan Wahi, is being charged by the Department of Justice along with his brother and friend in the first ever case of cryptocurrency insider trading. Ishan and his accomplices allegedly front ran several tokens by buying them before they were listed on Coinbase. Furthermore, Coinbase is being investigated by the SEC over unregistered securities being listed on the platform. And one of the biggest pieces of news in this story is that the SEC has classified nine tokens as securities in the filing. This was the first time the SEC has clearly defined a token as a security. Coinbase says it's, quote, confident that our rigorous process, a process the SEC has already reviewed, keeps securities off our platform. Shares of Coinbase dropped by more than 20% on news of the probe. Meanwhile, two U.S. senators want to make it easier to use Bitcoin to make everyday purchases. Senator Patrick Toomey of Pennsylvania and Senator Kirsten Sinema of Arizona have introduced the Virtual Currency Tax Fairness Act. It would exempt any cryptocurrency transaction up to $50 from being a taxable event. Toomey says our current tax code is blocking innovation in this industry. And many Bitcoiners would also argue it's inhibiting Bitcoin's growth as a medium of exchange. And now to El Salvador, where President Nayib Bukele made a big announcement to buy back $1.6 billion of the country's debt in dollar-denominated bonds. In a series of tweets, the president announced two bills that would, quote, make a transparent public and voluntary purchase offer to all holders of Salvadoran sovereign debt bonds from 2023 to 2025. This prompted a double-digit jump in the price of the junk-rated securities. Despite waves of criticism and speculation about El Salvador's financial situation, Bukele added that the nation has enough liquidity to pay all its commitments and purchase its own debt through 2025 in advance. And finally this week, a man who threw his hard drive containing 8,000 Bitcoins in the trash has come up with an interesting idea to try to find them. James Howells is planning to use robotic dogs to scan the landfill in Wales. They will sift through 110,000 tons of garbage looking for the hard drive containing the passcode to his wallet. And that is worth about $175 million today. Howell says he accidentally threw away the wrong hard drive back in 2013, and his latest plan will cost him about $11 million. Those are the latest Bitcoin headlines. Ahead, we speak to analyst Dylan LeClaire of Bitcoin Magazine and UTXO Management about the macro outlook, Bitcoin on-chain analytics, and the crypto contagion. Don't go away. Welcome back. Joining me now is one of our favorite Bitcoin analysts, Dylan LeClaire. Dylan, so nice to see you. Natalie, I'm excited for this. Thanks for having me on. All right. Well, Dylan, coming up, we have a special report on the crypto contagion. And I know it's something you spent a lot of time tracking and sounding alarms about even before we saw the crash of things like Luna and the withdrawal freezes. So what's your overall takeaway from what we saw with these over leveraged companies and how they impacted Bitcoin? 
Yeah, so I think, I mean, first of all, uh, it's it's interesting because you have things like Luna and UST and kind of a lot of the, the altcoins uh, in the space that, that I think a lot of Bitcoiners choose uh, rightfully to ignore or just not take the time to to learn about. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of these things and the leverage uh, in, inherently built into them uh, have an ex- have a kind of an impact on the Bitcoin exchange rate. Um, so with with UST and Luna, obviously there was you know bill- tens of billions of dollars of kind of value that just went poof uh, in the matter of days. And so I think that from for me, like just right after that collapse, it was pretty evident that there was a lot of of funds and companies and, and treasuries in the space. And, and the exact players weren't yet known, but uh, that had exposure to, to Luna and or UST. Uh, and because of that, you know, I kind of, as that was all going down, I was saying like, hey, uh, some insolvencies and some counterparty risk, uh, like these are the things to watch out for. And, and ultimately that daisy chain of leverage took out Three Arrows Capital, Celsius, uh, and, you know, left a lot of these lenders with, with billions of dollars of losses. Um, it wasn't known. The crazy thing was it wasn't known just how much unsecured and under collateralized lending was being done in the space. And so while uh, in a bull market, uh, these things can work and you can get away with it uh, and speculators um, can you know, be enriched with these practices in the bear market, uh, you know, the tide's washing out and you know, blow ups happen. So uh, you know, Bitcoin probably wouldn't have gone as high up without all this unsecured lending and, and leverage, but you know, at the same time, it's all been washed out for the most part. So you know, it's a net, uh, net not negative or positive. It's just kind of, it all nets out in the end. Yeah. It's real capitalism at work, but is the pain over or do you think that we could see more dominoes fall if say Bitcoin and the markets go lower? Yeah. I mean, I think in terms of the crypto native contagion, uh, if you will, a lot of that's past us. It's it's behind us. Um, Ultimately right now, Bitcoin is is trading just in line with equities and, and the NASDAQ. It's kind of riding the overall liquidity tide, which is fine. And it's kind of a natural development in its monetization process. Um, so the real question is whether risk assets in general have bottomed. And that's a question that no one really can answer. Um, obviously, there was some reaction to the Fed uh, meeting today um, with a 75 basis point hike and markets flying higher. Um, but in terms of risk markets uh, having bottomed uh, you know, entirely, that's, you know, that's yet to be known. Well, let's talk about the number of diamond hands. What is the percentage of people who are hodling and how does it maybe compare to, you know, 2017, 2018 when we were honestly around the same price? Yeah. So, I mean, it's pretty interesting because uh, going into this market, Bitcoin is such a, a, an inelastic asset, um, as we know, right? 21 million. Um, but because of, you know, the supply inelasticity and the, and the pattern of hodlers, both to the upside and the downside, Bitcoin is very reflexive. All right. And so that kind of feeds in uh, to the whole leverage dynamic like we talked about. But when there's just even a small amount of demand for a relatively, uh, you know, for an absolutely scarce asset where there's, you know, the free float isn't isn't all that high price source. And, and similarly, um, as a lot of sellers, particularly for sellers come into the market, uh, price can go down, you know, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty strong to the downside as well. So I still think it, it's pretty remarkable that, you know, 65, 64 percent of Bitcoin. Uh, the percentage of supply haven't moved in the last year. So this is like pretty close. We're not at all time highs, but it's it's very, very close to an all time high level of Bitcoin that have been held for over a year. So while there's certainly a ton of metrics we can look at, uh, you know, in terms of diamond hands, most hodlers uh, look to be pretty, pretty unfazed. And, you know, the average Bitcoiner who's been through a cycle has seen has seen multiple 80 percent drawdowns. That's right. I'm one of the bullish diamond hands. So, um, well, on a macroeconomic level, you shared an interesting tweet. We're going to put it up. You said, seeing a lot of bottom calls lately, here's U.S. total stock market value to GDP relative to historical standards. Can you tell us what we're seeing here? More broadly, what you've seen over the last 20 years and and really going into 2020, 2021, um, following the the record amount of stimulus that the Fed interjected into markets, uh, you saw equities as a percent of, of total U.S. GDP go to all-time high levels. So it was over 200%. Um, so the total value of the stock market relative to the, the U.S. Uh, GDP, gross domestic product. Um, and so that wasn't really sustainable. But I think what we're looking at is when you look at equities, bonds, real estate, we kind of were in this everything bubble, right? Where rates were low, debt levels are still astronomically high. How is this kind of imbalance going to be solved, right? And so it's still very, very elevated relative to historical standards, around 170% equity market cap to GDP. And so it can go a lot lower. The real question is, um, given how high debt levels relative to GDP are uh, and how over-financialized the U.S. uh, and really global economy is, what's the level uh, of pain that can be felt without the entire kind of house of cards falling down? 
And so I think that Powell and the Fed is, is really walking a tight rope here uh, between, you know, kind of hyper asset inflation and, and global deflationary bust. Uh, and they're trying to walk that line and we'll see if they're successful with it. But I think the end game here, uh, like always, is, is perpetual kind of monetary stimulus and more uh, intervention into credit markets. Exactly. It's just a question of when are they going to print again? And right now there's a debate as far as whether we're in a recession. I know you've been tracking what's happening with the labor market turnover. So what can you share with us on that front and how that might impact the markets going forward? Uh, in terms of recession, uh, you know, the technical definition is something that the White House will like to bicker about. But, uh, you know, certainly consumers are feeling, uh, you know, feeling, feeling it in their margins. Um, you see, you've seen rates uh, fly upwards. So mortgage rates are, are very, very high along with kind of, you know, sky high real estate prices, that's not, that's not helping the consumer. Um, the high inflation is going into everything from, you know, energy prices to food, uh, a lot of stuff like that is uh, supply in, inelastic relative um, to, to demand, right? So uh, people need food, they need gas. Um, and so, you know, to the extent of how much we see in terms of real productivity decline, I, I think that's to come uh, if we do see it. Um, and, and, you know, the, the economy will continue to deteriorate with, with these higher rates and the debt levels. Uh, and so I think that's ultimately why I believe a pivot uh, is, is, you know, a necessity at the end of the day, whether it comes, you know, late 2022 or 2023, um, the market's saying 2023. Uh, but I think at a, whether it's a recession now or later, I think one is coming uh, and we'll see to what extent the labor market uh, and really asset values, particularly real estate, uh, kind of feel the pain here. Uh, but certainly uh, the, I think the response on the other side of the recession uh, and whatever pain is being felt is gonna is gonna blow some blow some socks off uh, in terms of just the the scale and scope of it. All right, Dylan. Well, thank you so much. Always appreciate your analysis. And coming up on Hard Money, we go in depth with a special report on the crypto contagion. Oh, hi, I'm Max Kaiser, and this is Garcia Plucky. I got a new job. I'm now Plucky's trainer. We're doing some of these uh, sit ups here. He wants to get as strong as possible for the fiat money apocalypse. That's right, Max. We're both heading into the fiat money apocalypse and I'm stacking sets over a strong Bitcoin. Oh, that's so smart, Plucky. How did you get so smart? Get the Swan app. I had that intuition, that gut feeling that mm, I should move my stuff off, and then I didn't. It took too long for me to come around. I was right on the cusp, and then contagion goes fast. My idea was to just make 6%, you know, with free money. And it worked for a while. But I didn't feel like I was at a tremendous amount of risk. Then the news broke with Celsius. Then the news broke with Three Arrow Capital. I just enjoyed that sweet, sweet APY, so I left a little too much in Celsius, and it does hurt to lose. In hindsight, I learned a lot, but at the same time, I got wrecked. These are the stories of painful crypto lessons learned. Algorithmic stablecoin Terra USD and its sister token Luna collapsed. Cryptocurrency lenders Celsius and Voyager bankrupt. Cryptocurrency hedge fund Three Hours Capital bankrupt. The recent contagion in the crypto space has left some people losing their life savings, and it's unclear if more dominoes could fall. You're going to see a whole series of these actors get crushed to zero over the next few months in the contagion of, of leverage being caught offside with the lack of liquidity. Volatility is nothing new to crypto, but this recent so-called crypto winter has precipitated a chain reaction of deep losses and widespread pain, as spectacular demonstrations of mismanaged risk combined with extreme leverage are resulting in a massive cascade of insolvency, and it has pulled Bitcoin down further with it. Really, it all comes down to this collapse of Terra Luna, and that's what really kicked off this whole saga. There were a lot of people in the Bitcoin arena that were warning about this algorithmic link and how it wasn't stable. When prices started to go down, the whole thing unraveled. The peg broke. Luna, the associated cryptocurrency with Terra, went to zero. 
when Terra Luna tanked, holders with outsized exposure to the not-so-stable stablecoin were left scrambling to cover margin calls that they were catastrophically unprepared for, and the problem wasn't limited to simple reckless speculation. We're looking at a situation that it wasn't just over leverage, but there were maybe some bad actors in there as well. Crypto lending platforms like Celsius are facing accusations of deception and fraud impacting mom and pop retail depositors. There were Ponzi type characteristics at Celsius where they were attracting depositors with higher yields just so they could pay down the yield that they had promised their existing investors. They were absolutely trading the token to manipulate the price. Because you should be borrowing fiat or dollars against your Bitcoin and spending uh -huh. those dollars. That's what the rich people do. That was Celsius CEO Alex Mashinsky encouraging average retail investors to deposit their Bitcoin with his company before declaring bankruptcy and freezing customer accounts. Voyager Digital was another popular platform offering outsized yield on deposits while engaging in questionable risk management. We saw that with Voyager where they lent over 600 million uncollateralized in the form of USDC and Bitcoin as well. Now, why did they do this? We can look to the past for clues. In 2008, the great financial crisis was tipped off by reckless lending in the mortgage sector, fueled by a fear of missing out in a housing market that seemed to be going up only. When the market turned, the party was over. So what are the takeaways from this classic case of contagion? First, if it's not Bitcoin, it's, well, anyone's guess. But one thing's for sure, it's not hard money. Second, if you do lend your Bitcoin for yield, be aware of counterparty risk. In the end, the music does stop. And in Bitcoin, in crypto, there is no lender of last resort. Did I read all the terms and user agreements? No, I didn't read through the hundreds of lines of text. It just goes to show that if it's not Bitcoin, the chances of something happening are exponentially greater than just keeping it in cold storage. But there's also an argument that this washout of unhealthy projects will make the ecosystem healthier in the long run. After all, in real capitalism, risk is both rewarded and punished, allowed to fail, no bailouts from the Fed. We are in a crypto winter, though, where certain ideas, projects, monikers, acronyms will go away. They will die. What will survive? Bitcoin will survive. Welcome back to Hard Money. Joining me now for our weekly macro segment is Andy Edstrom, CFA and author of Why Buy Bitcoin. All right, Andy, the big news of the week is the Fed's rate hike decision. Tell us, what do you think about the hike and the market reaction? So the Fed did not surprise anyone this time around. They hiked rates by 75 basis points. That's three quarters of a percent, which is pretty much what the market was expecting. Um, obviously, it's a big hike by historical standards. This is the second three quarter percent rate hike that we've uh, seen in a row here. But the market had essentially priced it in and um, risk assets are up as a result. Well, Andy, we also got second quarter U.S. GDP data. The negative number means that we now have two consecutive quarters of GDP contraction, which means technically that the U.S. economy is in a recession, right? By most definitions. What's your take? Yeah. What is the definition of a recession? One answer is whatever the National Bureau of Economic Research says it is. Um, this is this department within the government that uh, declares recessions after the fact. Um, they don't do it live, so to speak. Uh, so you never know whether you were in a recession uh, until the time has passed. Someone quipped recently, you know, it's like uh, finding out you're, uh, you're ill after your funeral. But, um, but so that's one definition. I think the colloquial definition is two quarters of negative GDP. That is two quarters of GDP shrinkage. Um, and that is what we saw um, as a result of these recent numbers. So um, I think some people would argue that, oh, if employment is still strong, then maybe you're not technically in a recession. That's certainly what the White House seems to be arguing. So I don't know. I guess my view is that we probably, uh, we arguably are in a recession. Uh, it's a mild one by historical standards. Uh, but uh, only the uh, the economic historians will be able to to tell us for sure. Well, Andy, as far as macro goes, what are you focused on and tracking from here? So I am still very focused on inflation. I think inflation pretty much drives everything with respect to the Fed and therefore with financial markets, everything from you know stocks to bonds to gold to Bitcoin. Um, 
the thing about the actual inflation readings is they're in some sense lagging. Um, all economic data really are, are lagging, at least to some degree. And so um, I am looking at signs of slowing inflation or reversals in inflation uh, in measurable uh, commodities, for example, you know, what's going on with oil and gas and energy overall, what's going on with building materials, um, metals, et cetera. And so that's one thing that I'm looking at pretty closely as perhaps a coincident or leading indicator of official inflation statistics, where those official inflation statistics uh, perhaps are going to drive people's expectations as well as drive Fed's activity uh, with respect to rate hikes and monetary policy going forward. All right, Andy. Well, as always, so great to have you. That was Andy Edstrom with your weekly macro update. Thank you so much for watching this week's edition of Hard Money. Our goal is to give you the latest headlines impacting Bitcoin and the global economy while bringing you original interviews straight from the biggest names in the space. I'm Natalie Brunel, and I'll see you next week.